Okay, we're back. We're live. Here it is on a Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. And we're doing Community Matters with Adam Reversi, who is a Deputy Corporation Counsel for the County of Kauai. He joins us by Skype from Lihui. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thanks, Jay. Great to have you on. Adam and I met at a uh, Leadership Institute of the Hawaii State Bar Association last week, and uh, I thought we ought to continue the conversation here on ThinkTech. Uh, so we talked about what we could what we could learn from Adam in terms of his experience as a uh, deputy uh, uh, a deputy corporation counsel in Kauai, and we settled on a paper that he wrote about uh, Wainiha, Wainiha Land Hui in Kauai, which is a very interesting story dating way back into the early early days of the 19th century. Um, so can you uh, can you tell us a little about? Uh, how you got involved in the subject, I guess it was in law school, why you wrote about that, why you researched that, and, and what essentially is, is the subject? Uh, sure, for, for your listeners who don't know, Wainiha is an ahupua on the north shore of Kauai. Um, Wainiha and Hyena are essentially the gateway to the Nepali coast at the end of the road here on Kauai. It's uh, in my opinion, the lushest and most beautiful parts of our island. Um, while I was in law school, I read a book about Hyena by a fellow named Con uh, Carlos Andrade that's not so much a legal book, but I thought it was fascinating. And it, it made a reference to the Wainiha land hui, which I had never heard of. Um, and I had an extended family living in Wainiha who was farming some of the last remaining taro lohi up there. And I I'm a history buff, was a history major in undergrad, and uh, wanted to learn more, and was required to do a semester-long paper in law school, so I chose to do a legal history about the Wainiha land hui um, as part of this project, which ended up being eventually published in the uh, University of Hawaii Law Review. Mm, uh, outstanding. Uh, for those who don't know, that's the top publication in any law school, and it's very important for a law school to have that. It, 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 it helps the credibility of the law school, but it also is a, it's a great prestige point for anybody to have an article in a law review, whether you're on the editorial board or not. And so that's an achievement all in itself. So Adam, um, tell us what happened. What did you learn in your research? What did you write about? Uh, sure. So. Uh, you uh, first, first to put it in in context, modern context, real quickly. Um, as it, I'm sure it is on every island, um, there are continuing issues on Kauai about housing and uh, the disenfranchisement of the local population, the gentrification of communities, and the influx of vacation rentals pushing local people out, etc. And uh, I think in in a uh, Maybe as I describe this further, I think that this this historically dovetails into into that. And um, I'll start start out when I first started just googling information to learn about the Wainiha Hui. I came across an article in the uh, Hawaii Almanac from 1913 by a Reverend John Lydgate, and the Hawaii Almanac was essentially the Reader's Digest of Hawaii back in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, had shipping schedules and goings on, and John Lydgate described the formation of the Wainiha Land Hui, uh, and the story went something like this, that um, the Ali'i Kani Kekau Nohi, who inherited in the great Mahele the entire Ahupua'a of Wainiha, uh, took pity on his local subjects and decided that he would uh, sell his land to them cheaply. Uh, they purchased it, and immediately began infighting and fraud among each other, and they ended up in misery. Wouldn't you know it. Um, that was John Lydgate's story. Um, but as soon as I started to do my own research, I, I discovered that virtually everything John Lydgate had to say was false. Um, so uh, another little contextual note. Um, so not to go into the whole history of the great Mahele and the creation of private property in Hawaii, but um, we mentioned in our initial conversation what sets Kauai apart. And one of the things that set Kauai apart during that period of time is that it had the uh, smallest percentage of Kuleana awards to Native Hawaiians of any island in uh, the kingdom, aside from Lanai. Um, so Kauai Kauaians were largely left out of this new private property regime 
uh, when Kuliana lots were awarded to tenants of the land. And one of the one of Kauai's solutions to that problem was to form land hui's, which purchased enormous blocks of property. And specific to the Wainiha land hui, um, Kekau Unohi had originally inherited the 15,000 acre, uh, not inherited, but had been granted the 15,000 acre ahupua of Wainiha, um, but died very soon after. And, and uh, Kekau Unohi was actually a she, not a, not a, a li'ikani like uh, John Lydgate had described. Um, the property then went to, uh, was inherited by her husband, who also died soon afterwards. And then uh, to pay off his debts, the entire Ahupua'a uh, was sold off to a couple of investors from Honolulu. Shortly thereafter, was purchased by Castle and Cook. And then in 1877, 71 Native Hawaiian families pooled their resources and bought all 15,000 acres from Castle and Cook for $5,500. Castle and Cook made a profit? Um, I'm not sure what Castle and, I wasn't able to find out what Castle and Cook purchased it from, but I knew to, do know that at the foreclosure proceeding, um, it was purchased for $3,200. So there's a couple of thousand dollars difference in there. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me just uh, do context with you. <clears throat> so the, so the, um, see the, the unification of the state was back in the very early part of the 19th century um, the, and Kauai was never conquered by Kamehameha uh, and Kauai was always a little different what was the relationship of Kauai and the in the rest of the state at this point and what was his part you suggested there was a there was a participation but it's sort of a, a, a low-level participation in the great Mahaley of what 1848 or so uh, what, what was the relationship in general of Kauai and the rest of the state at that time? Um, you know, I, could, I can't tell you its official political status, but even though Kauai wasn't ever conquered, it was, it was essentially brought into the kingdom by subterfuge when the then king of Kauai was kidnapped <laughs> and forced to marry into Kamehameha's family. So okay. although it wasn't militarily conquered, it was effectively brought in under the control of the kingdom by the time this Hui, the, the Hui event was taking place. And uh, so one of the reasons that Kauai was a part, I think, in the initial um, disbursement of Kuleana properties was that at least in the early stages of the Kuleana award process, you actually had to appear at the land commission, which was in Honolulu. Uh -huh. um, in the 1850s, it was difficult for somebody from Kauai to get 90 miles across the channel to Honolulu. So I think it was just simply physical, a physical barrier for Kauai uh, residents to make claims at the Land Commission. I think in the, in the later stages of the Land Commission process, there was a local office opened. But uh, um, that's, that's at least part of the explanation is just geographic isolation. Yeah. Yeah, now the, the Great Mahaley was uh, in Honolulu, I guess. It was well it was centralized in that way. Um, but it sounds like Kauai had its own mm, smaller Mahaley, uh, and it was somehow resonant with the Great Mahaley, wasn't it? Uh, sure. Well, it was, it was part and parcel of the Mahaley that was you know, based at the Land Commission, which was housed in Honolulu, but it affected land ownership in, on all the islands. Ah, okay. All right, so now we have, uh, what does it say, 1877, and we have this uh, group, the group of people, Hawaiian, uh, Native Hawaiian people, who raised the money and, and bought these 15,000 acres from Castle and Cook for $5,000. I'd take that deal today, by the way. I want to be clear about it. Uh, if, if it can be found for me, maybe you can help me with that. Sorry, I missed, I missed that last question. I'd take that deal now. Oh, I would too. <laughs> Yeah. So one of the, one of the fascinating things, at least fascinating to me, about the land hui is that um, you know pr prior to the creation of private property in Hawaii, with the Great Mahale and the distribution of Kuleana lands, essentially the native tenants or native residents lived communally in Ahupua, farming their own their own individual plots and having a house lot, but also sharing the upland area and the lowland fisheries and communal farming lots. And once these 71 individuals purchased that 15,000 uh, acre ahupua, they established a constitution for themselves to continue living in exactly that fashion. They had uh, small allotments 
uh, for each of themselves, but they established communal rules as to how the upland forest would be managed, how the fishery would be managed. They set limits on the number of uh, livestock that every tenant in the Apua could have. They had communal roundups and rules for branding. They had an elected uh, konohiki. They established kapu times for fishing. They uh, gave an exclusive right to fish for hei or octopus to a group of specific women. They regulated the numbers of nets that every tenant in the Apua could have so that nobody would catch too many fish. They regulated how many fish traps every every resident could have so that the fish in the stream wouldn't be overfished. So it was a, an incredibly well-organized system based in a written constitution um, to govern, the, essentially govern themselves. They even had uh, their own sort of independent judiciary system where uh, disputes between any member of the Hui had to be internally addressed first before they would be allowed to take their, uh, get on their horse or walk to Lahui and bring their case to court. Oh, how interesting. So a constitution. Now, I guess the monarchy back in Honolulu and Iolani Palace uh, had to approve of that. But that's interesting to have a constitution within a constitutional monarchy. How, how did that work? I mean, uh, uh, there must have been some contention about it, no? Um, well, actually, uh, part, of, part of my paper, the very involved sort of legalese part of it is how uh, the Supreme Court, through a whole series of decisions, dealt with land hui's on all the islands. And um, the Supreme Court initially uh, viewed these hui constitutions, which were common on all islands, mm. actually as uh, contracts, essentially binding contracts among the members. That's so not unreasonable, it, it, is it? I mean, it's a reasonable interpretation. In other words, it isn't a question of sovereignty. There really is no sovereignty because it comes within, within the sovereign. But you can treat it as a contract and uh, about how people are going to conduct themselves. I guess where I get stuck is in the judicial side of things when they have a judicial system that operates um, um, sort of under another judicial system. Uh, I, I gather, although there's not a lot of details in the record books, which, actually, which notably are um, housed at the state archives, I believe that they're... Um, one of the only, if not the only, written Hui constitution and record book that's still in existence. Um, and anybody could go to the state archives and see copies of that today. Yeah, or and see, you have. See the, the original, actually. You, ha um, you so have there. seen the original. You have gone to the state archives, and part of your paper, I'm sure, is, is built on uh, reading it and looking at it and handling it, yeah? Yes, I actually had to have uh, a very willing friend of mine um, do the translation because unfortunately I don't speak Hawaiian and it's actually written in uh, Hawaiian language. Is it handwritten? Correct, yeah. Oh, how interesting. How long is it? Uh, I think it's about 120 pages, which Whoa. is uh, the original constitution and then it has the records of all the meetings and the, and the transactions of the organization. Well, so this is a... Uh, an elected treasurer, secretary, and the Constitution set out the regular meetings and elections of the Konohi Gate for the um, Land Hui. Now, another one of the fascinating aspects of this Land Hui, but um, from my research, all Land Hui's across the islands, is that um, at least when they were first founded, they had specific provisions in their Constitution to maintain the integrity of their land base in that um, you weren't allowed to sell to outsiders. Uh, so if somebody in, that had a, they, each individual would own a share in the Hui, so there were 71 shares. And if somebody uh, died, didn't have an heir, or wanted to sell, they had to, they had to offer the shares for sale to the Hui for uh, what they purchased it for. So not only could they not alienate the land, but they couldn't make a profit. Huh. It sounds like a co-op in Manhattan. But hey, <laughs> let's take a short break. That's Adam Reversi, the county, deputy county attorney in Kauai. He uh, did a research paper. We're talking about Wahina and Wahina uh, land buoys all around Wai the state, in fact. Wai, 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 Wai yeah, Wainiha in Kauai. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. 
You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Okay, we're back. We're live with Adam Reversi, a deputy county attorney in Kauai, talking about some research that he did on Waineha Valley in Kauai, in the Waineha land hui, um, not unlike a number of land hui's that existed in the 19th century. So, Adam, as we left it, uh, these families uh, successfully operated under that land hui for a while. But over time, you know, I'm, I'm only guessing here that we don't have that anymore. What happened to it? Sure. Yeah, they, they actually persisted for almost 100 years until 1947. So there was a, there was a, a couple of things that came together to, to, to for the death knell of the Wainia, but for who is all over the entire uh, state or then kingdom. Um, so and they, they arose from uh, a series of Supreme Court decisions. So the very first decision involved uh, deciding whether these Hui's were tenancies in common or joint tenants or joint tenancies. Those are two legal phrases, but the, the practical um, effect is that if, if something is a tenancy in common and an owner dies, the uh, ownership interest passes to their heirs. If something is a joint tenancy and the owner dies, then the ownership interest reverts to the other owners. Mm -hmm. So um, the court in 1886 decided that land hui's were tenancies in common, which means whenever a hui, which meant that whenever a hui member passed away, their ownership interests would go to their heirs. Um, and that what that decision did is it quickly fractionalized the in ownership in land hui's, the Wainia hui specifically, but all land hui's across the state. So instead of having 71 members within a generation or two, you quickly have hundreds, if not thousands. The old of, story, you know, and, and nobody, well, I guess, had had one of those members had a will, which uh, disposed of that property to say one person or two, uh, you wouldn't have this fragmentation. But I guess nobody had a will in those days. There weren't enough lawyers around, eh? No, and that, that didn't seem to be a tradition among the Native Hawaiians to do wills. Um, and, a, and a second decision, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, Originally, the Supreme Court viewed Hui constitutions as binding contracts um, that fit in with Native Hawaiian traditional and customary practices. So the court took a very positive view of Hui's, and actually their decisions really supported their rights to self-governance and to govern themselves and to control their members. Um, in the early 1900s, a new Supreme Court, all appointed after the overthrow of Queen Lilo Kalani, took a much different view of the Hui's and essentially decided in, a, in two, two different court cases, ultimately the Ma'alo case, that the land Hui's were legally not recognizable entities. They were just collections of individuals that had their own rights. So uh, with that Supreme Court decision, the land hui could no longer stop its individual members from selling off their portions oh. of the, or could no longer control the fragmentation of their land. Um, That's interesting because today, right now, in 2017, you can do that. You can make a co-tenancy agreement and have exactly the same effect. But I guess they weren't in the mood to uh, help perpetuate the land hui's back right after territoriality. Yeah. So that, that then led to uh, the Partition Act of 1923, which allowed, uh, just as an abstract example, if a piece of property were owned by 100 individuals and one individual wanted to sell, he could force the partition of the property in order to get his money out. Mm -hmm. um, and that paralleled one other important fact for Wainiha. Um, back in 1903, the Wainiha Hui, then still a powerful collective entity, leased the water rights in the Wainiha River to the McBride Sugar Company to create a power plant. And McBride used the energy generated from that power plant to drive 
the water pumps on the south shore in order to irrigate the sugar plantation. Mm -hmm. um, so that was in 1903, the Hui granted McBride a 50-year lease to the water rights in the Wainiha stream. For a generator, mm -hmm. a hydropower hydro generator, which I think still exists, no? It does. It's still there today, still generating power for KIUC. Amazing. Um, so that was a 50-year lease. Right after, shortly after the Malo case that I mentioned, that's that's uh, just determined that the individual share, the individual sales could not be stopped by the Hui. McBride Sugar began buying up shares in the Wainiha Hui, um, and by uh, the 1940s, McBride had had managed to accumulate uh, nearly 50 percent of the Wainiha Hui shares that were outstanding. Mm -hmm. And a matter of only four or five years before their lease to the water expired, they instituted partition proceedings uh, in court here on Kauai to divide up Wainiha Valley um, into multiple discrete parts. Um, and So the idea was that they could, because they held certain parts, uh, they could call for the separation of the land their part and the parts of everybody else. Uh, that must have been a pretty scraggly boundary. Um, it, it was quite an involved proceeding. The court record here on Kauai, which have actually gone and looked at on microfiche, is four or five hundred pages of details. Um, but the, the end result was that in 1947, the Wainiahui that had been established way back in 1869 was forced, forcibly broken apart through this judicial proceeding. Um, the, the practical end result was that the lower valley, which is closest to the ocean, was divided into 250 house lots, which were given or sold to the then residents of the area. Mm -hmm. And the upland 10,000 acres of Ahupua all became private property of McBride Sugar, along with the power plant and water rights to Wainiha River. Mm -hmm. And of course, McBride was already in the sugar business by then, but uh, when it confirmed title, it probably uh, expanded its uh, sugar operations, no? And, and they ended up, uh, let's see, that they ended up, that ended up costing McBride at the time for their 10,000 acres, as well as the uh, rights to the water, $48,000. That was in I'd 19. take that deal too. I want to be clear. I would take that deal just as much uh, right yeah. now today. <laughs> um, inter interestingly, part of that partition proceeding uh, provided that, and this is to McBride's benefit, I guess, that the, all of the deeds that were handed out to the individual property owners um, ostensibly required the preservation of all the traditional irrigation OI that were uh, feeding the taro uh, loi and Wainiha, which had traditionally been a huge taro growing area. Um, but unfortunately, as of today, virtually all of them have been destroyed, just despite the fact that uh, they were supposedly protected in connection with this partition proceeding. Um, they, not many exist today. I think there's only uh, uh, maybe 20 acres that are still being uh, farmed in Tarot and Wainia today. So interesting. So, but there are still Native Hawaiians on that land, huh? Um, it's it's it is a, a pocket of continued Native Hawaiian uh, land ownership here on Kauai, uh, and and one th you you asked uh, when we when we talked a few days ago, you know what's going on on Kauai now, and I sort of reverted back to this historical um, paper. But one thing that was happening just recently here on Kauai that was all over our front page of the paper is there was a uh, a land dispute in Wainiha down by the. Um, uh, the main highway, a, a group of young Native Hawaiian activists were attempting to reclaim uh, an area that had once been um, a taro growing area and were planting kalo and had uh, a, a built a, uh, a small shed area and they were all arrested for trespassing. It was in the news. They had the mayor go down to try to assuage everyone. and. Uh, it became a it became a a big deal politically and in the news here on Kauai and it 
got me thinking back about this paper that I'd written several years ago about the, the context, historical context in which that current dispute is still ongoing. Oh, really? It hasn't been resolved? Not with this particular uh, parcel. I think, you know, the, these young guys are still um, pending their day in court for their trespassing charges, et cetera, and mm -hmm. um, continuing to fight with the landowner who owns that property. And McBride is not doing sugar anymore. McBride is essentially out of the sugar business. What, what is the condition of the land? And you, you suggested that McBride had disposed of its title. So who owns it? I mean, it's part of it. Uh, I'm not sure what the, I, I know that the, uh, the predecessor, whatever the name of it is, the predecessor of McBride uh, still owns the upper 10,000 acres of the valley. And I think it's actually in a partnership of some sort I could be wrong about this, but I think it's still in partnership of some sort with uh, the Nature Conservancy, who, mm -hmm. is a, who has fenced the area to uh, do um, native Hawaiian plant restoration and uh, eliminate feral pigs, et cetera, as part of the statewide watershed rehabilitation plan. So the upper Wainiha Valley is uh, still unoccupied, just forest land and the stream. It's a fairly steep valley. Um, and I guess that the folks controlling it are doing their best to restore it to the extent that they can. Yeah, but it's, uh, you know, when you, when you have sugar growing a long time, it's hard to restore it. And uh, I suppose a lot of it is really not yet uh, re reforested and uh, re well, replanted. Sh sugar, so sugar was never grown in Wainiha. Wainiha is too steep for sugar. Ah. The, the Wai McBride's operations were on the opposite side of the island and they actually ran the power lines from uh, Wainiha around and over the mountain to get to the their sugar operations on the other side. So Wainiha never had sugar. It's too steep and mountainous um, for uh, for that. So why why did McBride want it in the first place? Fifteen thousand acres, forty eight thousand dollars. Why why did they go to that trouble if they weren't going to do sugar on it? Uh, they wanted it for the power plant for the water. Ah, okay, okay. Water was important. You know, it, it strikes me that this could be the uh, the mythical valley in uh, uh, in the in the uh, that book that was written. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. The Descendants, the Descendants book. Is this the mythical valley, Adam? <laughs> uh, no, the uh, the mythical valley from the Descendants is, uh, I believe, Kipukai over on the uh, southeast corner of Kauai. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. Uh, so what do you take? What do you take from this study, from this discussion, about you know what what can we learn here? The Ahapua was a, a valuable way of living. It certainly preserved the land, preserved the community. There were a lot of positive aspects to it, and little by little, you've described the story about how it came apart. Um, but what what do you take from it? You studied it. You spent the time. You did the research. What do you learn from it? Well, one of, one takeaway for me, uh, a lot of the history that you read about the Mahele is as uh, Native Hawaiians solely as victims. You know, this thing happened to them, was imposed on them, and everything was downhill from there. But I think that the, the Wainiha Hui in particular, but the Hui movement generally on all the islands, demonstrated that Native Hawaiian tenants at the time were, were not necessarily helpless victims. They mobilized themselves in an organized fashion. They used this new regime of private property to buy large blocks of land, to continue living the way that they had lived. Um, and they were, they were able to successfully do so for quite a while until the law and modernity caught up with them. But uh, it, for me at least, changed the predominant story that I learned about the Mahalay and, um, you know, uh, the, the passive role that Native Hawaiians played in it. This, I think this demonstrates that, that the Native Hawaiians at the time were not passive. They took an active role in trying to make their lives better and continue living the way they had lived. Yeah, and, and, this was and they did a good job at it for quite a while. Profoundly affected by the overthrow and what followed in territorialization. So uh, very interesting. If I wanted to learn more, if I wanted to read your article, where would I look? Um, I think that the uh, University of Hawaii Law Review is available online via the university's website. And I'm, 
I'm not sure if you actually have to pay something or if it's for free. It's been a long time since I've looked, but uh, I'd also be I'd also be happy to share copies of it um, to people by email. I don't know if giving out my email is a good idea or not. Do you, do you do that? Sure, you can. Sure. So it's just my name, Adam Roversi, which is R O V like Victor E R S I at gmail dot com, and Thank I'd be you, happy Adam. to send anybody a PDF of the paper. Thank you, Adam. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a great discussion. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Aloha.